and welcome to our Facebook and YouTube followers as well, and of course our dear friends on Zoom. So coming up in only a few days, actually today is Rosh Hodesh. Today is the new month that starts the month that, of course, Shavuot falls in. This Sunday night is going to be the first of two days of Shavuot, the holiday that we described already as being the um, holiday that celebrates Zman Matan Torah Tenu, the giving of the Torah to the Jewish people. A lot to say on this holiday. We've covered a lot of things already. I want to cover a new aspect because we mentioned how the Torah does not describe the giving of the Torah as appearing on Shavuot. Very unusual. It describes Shavuot as an agricultural holiday that we're going to talk about in a few moments. And it describes Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah Mount Sinai in the Jewish year 2448, that is 3,333 years ago, almost to the day. That much we get. However, it doesn't connect the two. It doesn't connect the date, the holiday of Shavuot, also known as Atzeret, together with what happened on it, Zman Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah. And we start to look at a few different answers to that. We're going to delve a little bit into that once again. However, what we are going to try to figure out is what are we meant to do on this holiday? Why is it so mysterious and shrouded in mystery? And finally, why is it described as an agricultural holiday? Really, that's what it's about. If you read the description of Shavuot in the Torah, it appears as an agricultural holiday, a time when all the crops are coming out of the ground and all the produce that we planted and seeded and then pruned. And finally, we get to glean the beautiful produce that are the results of our efforts. And that's Shavuot. Just like it doesn't seem to fit in really with the theme of the day, which is the giving of the Torah. And the answer is going to be that it is extremely linked. Agriculture and Torah are really one thing, and each one can teach us something about the other. Well, let's start again with a few basics. The Torah was given at Mount Sinai, and although we are not told in the Torah what date that event happened, we get a full description of what did happen at that time. And that can be found in Parshat of Yitro. Yitro was the father-in-law of Moshe Rabbeinu. It's interesting actually why the giving of the Torah appears in a Torah portion that is actually a convert. Yitro was not part of the Jewish people by genealogy. He is considered one of the first and greatest converts in Jewish history. Yitro, I mean, he married his daughter, Tzipporah, to Moshe Rabbeinu. So he must have been a very, very interesting individual. And actually he was. The commentators tell us that there was not an Avodah Zarah, there was not an idol that Yitro had not worshipped and been a minister, a priest. He was a priest, quite Midian. Fascinating. That means he traveled far and wide and he tried every form of idol worship that was out there until he concluded that the Torah from God, after seeing and hearing about the miracles that happened to the Jewish people, he said, wow, this is it. These are the people who God put the plagues in Egypt for. These are the people that God allowed to defeat Amalek. These are the people that God allowed to split the Red Sea. These are my people. And Yitro converted. I mean, it's interesting that the story of the giving of the Torah is found in the Torah portion, which happens to also be my Bar Mitzvah portion of Yitro. And one answer is because, first of all, we see the desire. I mean, all of you are hopefully have seen it at least one time in your lives the great desire and effort that a convert puts into their conversion. It's inspiring to see it, to see how they push themselves in order to become part of the Jewish people. It's not easy. They grew up with different families, 
customs, lives. I mean, I've been involved, I am involved right now. I spoke to one yesterday with students who are going through conversion processes. I've been on the bed din a number of times on a court of law to be there as they've taken on all 630 mitzvot and become part of our people. The emotion and the time and the effort, it's always, always a challenge. Something they have to fight in order to obtain. Ask any convert, was it an easy ride? Not one convert will ever tell you, yeah, that was a piece of cake. Wow, I just walked straight in. It takes time, effort, energy, passion, and desire. And every convert who's gone through the conversion process has had to tap down inside themselves to really find the spiritual, mental strength to make the process happen. When they do it and become part of the Jewish people, unbelievable. Maybe, my friends, that's one of the reasons that the description of the giving of the Torah is actually headlined by Yitro, the convert. Because in the end, all the Jewish people who stood at Mount Sinai, Har Sinai, 50 days after leaving Egypt, we were all really converts. I mean, it's pretty true. We had gone from before receiving the Torah to after receiving the Torah. Before receiving the Torah, we were not obligated to mitzvot. After receiving the Torah, we were obligated to all the mitzvot, exactly the same as a convert. And maybe we can, not only maybe, we can. We can learn from the convert. It's one of the reasons that we read Sefer Rut, the story of Ruth, the great, great, great grandmother of King David, that holy convert to Judaism, who we actually learn many laws of conversion from by seeing her desire to join Nomi and say, your people, my people, your Torah, my Torah, your mitzvot, where you live, I live, where you do, I do, where you die, I die as well. This was a person who gave up everything in order to be part of the Jewish people. Wow, how inspiring. It makes us feel a little guilty, right? We're just kind of born Jewish and that's it. But that's not it. We still have to push ourselves and have to work hard at being worthy of receiving the Torah. And that's one of the reasons the Torah is mentioned, the description in the parasha of Yitro, and one of the reasons that we read the book of Ruth on Shavuot. But there's more. And the more we already mentioned a few times is that the date of Shavuot is not mentioned in the Torah, as opposed to every other Jewish holiday where it is mentioned. There is no name for Shavuot. I mean, we call it Shavuot, but that doesn't describe anything except weeks. Shavuot means weeks, referring to the seven weeks that preceded the day itself. We also have no object that we use on Rosh Hashanah, the Shofar. On, that's the mitzvah object that you fulfill the mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah with. On Pesach, we have the matzah, the maror, the four kosot, four cups of wine, and we read the Haggadah. There's object. Yom Kippur, okay, we're fasting. Sukkot, we have the Sukkah. Even Purim and Hanukkah, we have the Megillah and the various Sudot and other things that we do. And Hanukkah, we have the Menorah. And yet comes on Shavuot, no. You want to stay up all night, learn Torah, beautiful. But if you don't, you still fulfill the mitzvah of Shavuot. Maybe one of the reasons why this is true, my friends, is because the Torah is so great and so expansive that to limit it by a name and a date and an object is diminishing the incredible epic size and quality of what the Torah is. I mentioned the class last night, it's actually in Manhattan, I'll say it again, that many, many universities have Bible studies departments. And we, the Jewish people, for us, we don't have Bible study, we have Torah. Torah and Bible are two very, very different things. Bible may be a translation of the Torah, they call it the Old Testament. There's nothing old about it whatsoever, as we're going to see. That's really the topic of today. The Torah for us is a holy book given to us by God, via Moshe Rabbeinu, and directly to us, the Jewish people, and is relevant to all the Jewish people throughout the entire world for all of Jewish history. That, my friends, is the power of the Torah. But there's something very interesting, because in the agricultural description of the Torah, of Shavuot, it does say that we have to bring a mincha chadasha. A mincha means a offering, actually means a gift. The word mincha literally means a gift. 
Chadasha, that is new. You know what Shavuot is all about? Bringing a new offering. Now on the surface, that is actually referring to something very specific. And that is wheat. Wheat around this time of year is now agriculturally available in the land of Israel. Just like when we left Egypt, barley seems to have been one of the first crops that came out. We brought the Omer offering of barley, which we said is a lower quality grain and animal food because we were a little bit animalistic and unrefined when we left Egypt. But then we count 49 days and on the 50th, the wheat is here. And so on Shavuot, a wheat offering was brought. Chadash, a new wheat offering was brought and actually came in the form of two loaves of wheat bread. They were brought as an offering. And a part of that is obviously just a thanks to Hashem, right? a thanks to God. We have this new crop, we're very happy and we're very excited. And the new crop has come out. We take a little bit of it and we bring us an offering saying, thank you so much, Hashem. Right? We appreciate this beautiful, bountiful harvest that we're celebrating right now. And the first thing we're going to do is bring a gift to the Mishkan, to you and your representatives, the Goanim, so they can enjoy it. Okay, so it makes sense, right? Min chachadasha. The wheat's come up. I want to give a little bit, a thank you to Hashem, just like we give um, charity from the money we earn. We take a little bit that we've earned and we give it away. It's a beautiful, beautiful concept and idea. But there's a crossover here as well. There's a crossover between this Mincha Hadasha and the fact, which is this new offering that is brought of wheat on Shavuot, and the fact that Shavuot is also the giving of the Torah, Zman, Matan, Torah Tenu, the time of the giving of the Torah. What is the connection? Comes along one of the great commentators by the name of the Kliakar, and he says, you know, Although the Torah does not mention the fact that the Torah was given on Shavuot, because it doesn't want to limit the Torah to only one day. If the Torah would mention that the Torah was given on Shavuot, and Shavuot is man matan Torah teinu, that's the day of the receiving the Torah, what would you quite understandably think, although it would be incorrect, that the Torah should only be studied on Shavuot? Why would I think that? Well, says the Kliakar, it makes sense because you only eat matzah on Pesach, you only sit in the sukkah on Sukkot, you only light the menorah on Hanukkah, you only read Megillat Esther on Purim. And so it would make sense that if, hey, comes along the time of the giving of the Torah, that will be the only day I study Torah, one day a year. Obviously, Hashem, God, and the Torah want to prevent that idea. And therefore, the Torah describes the giving of the Torah. It's a beautiful, epic event, as we said in Exodus chapter 20, Shemot Chaf. But don't limit it to one day, because the Torah should be studied every single day of the year. It's a constant gift that keeps giving. But not only that. And here's the key point I want to share with you. And this is what we, as teachers, rabbis, parents, grandparents, friends struggle with and should struggle with. And that is Mencha Chadasha. Says the Kliyaka, listen very carefully, it's a beautiful piece. He says, you know what? What we need to do, he says, and the reason the Torah describes Shavuot as a time when we bring a Mencha Chadasha, a new harvest gift, of wheat at that time is because Mincha Chadasha does not only refer to agricultural produce, it also refers to the Torah itself. It's a hint, it's not explicit. We said that already. It can't be explicit, but there is a remez, a hint, a code that's been planted, excuse the pun, in the Torah, and that is the Torah should appear to you all the time as a mencha chadasha, as a brand new, fresh gift. That is what Torah should mean. What does that mean? What is the Kliyaka telling us? He's saying something very, very profound, which is mentioned in many, many other places in different ways and forms. But this, I believe, is one of the sources for it. And that is the key 
to being Jewish. And when I say that, I mean to being connected as Jewish, to want to become part of the Jewish people, to honor and practice Torah and mitzvot, and most importantly, if, I, if you don't mind me saying, to pass it on to the next generation, is to make it feel fresh. The Ramban tells us the mistake that many people make, and the Ramban wrote this play nearly a thousand years ago, is that people keep the Torah like it's an ancient text, right? like some Dead Sea Scrolls. There's an old book that's been passed down from generation to generation, and it's full of nice ideas, and some not so good ideas, and certain things we should do, and things that we shouldn't do, and once in a while I'll brush off my encyclopedia, pull off the shelf, blow off the dust, and I'll read through a little bit. That's not what the Torah should be, says the Ramban, and pretty much everyone else, by the way. The Torah should be a fresh, living document. Something that we can connect to on a daily basis, just like a new seed gives off new shoots and new blossoms and new fruit, all the time, it's constantly in the process of giving, so too, we need to find, and this is not easy, I'm just gonna say it, something which I have to work on myself all the time, and any practicing Jew and connected spiritual Jew needs to work on, and that is, how do I find newness and freshness in my Judaism? What does that mean? How do I get excited, passionate? Where do I find the alacrity, the desire, to really make this a major part of my life. Not just a set of encyclopedia, right? If you remember in those days, we used to have it, and just stick it on the wall, and once in a while, put it off, look something up, and stick it back in there. Oh my goodness. That's not what the Torah is meant to be. It's meant to be a mincha, chadashas is the Torah. And that's not just a wheat sacrifice. That's a way of relating, a pride that we have in our Judaism. And in order to get a newness out of it, you gotta study it. And when you study it, you gotta realize that it's not just an ancient text, but it is a gift, a daily gift from Hashem, from God. Maybe that's one of the reasons we say Berachat Torah every single morning before we learn Torah. Part of the early part of the Shachrit service is that we make blessings over the Torah. Why do I do that? Why do I need to make a blessing every single day? Because when you bless something, you're saying this thing is relevant and about to be enjoyed now. This is what we're about. And my friends, the Torah is what we're really, really all about. There's a lot of great things about being Jewish. Right? No doubt, we have beautiful land of Israel and even the midst of what we do over there. We have wonderful relationships with our friends and family. We have this beautiful gift called Shabbat. There's so much good stuff. But the top peak that pulls it all together is what we're doing right now, and that is learning Torah. Learning Torah is what keeps us connected forever. It's so crucial. And how do we pass this on to our children? You know, actually today I had to, I was off the opportunity to speak in my children. My daughters are in a high school over here. Three of my daughters, Baruch Hashem, are in high school. Yes, I pay a lot of money, but I'm honest to do that. And the principal called me up and said, it's Erev Shavuot, will you come in and speak? So we pledge we'll pay you. I said, whatever you're going to pay me, give it as donation to the school, whatever, I don't really care, yeah? So I said, no problem. You know, I'll be delighted to come in and speak. And I was looking at these young children whose parents spend a lot of time, effort, and energy and money to send their kids to this school, including my three daughters and one has graduated, you know? And I was like, wow, this is an epic responsibility. I had this flash. I was like, we've got to get these kids really affected. Because we're not going to be here forever. And we have to pass the baton. We're going to have to pass the torch onto the next generation. But how do I make sure that my kids are passionate and feel connected to Judaism? Friends, there's a tried and tested method. And it works. And that is make yourself excited and passionate about being Jewish. Even when you're not because you aren't always going to be, at those moments, fake it. Just fake it, as they say, till you make it. And sometimes we just go through the system and just make it happen. 
That's okay. That's what we've got to do. Because we've got to keep ourselves consistent and connected. And by doing so, and by at least showing a passion and excitement and a pride for being Jewish and Israel and mitzvah, right? Rabbi Moshe Feinstein says, one of the reasons, one of the reasons that Judaism was dropped off in such a big way in the early 1900s, when all these people moved to America from religious communities back in Europe and the Middle East, and they came and dropped it, is because they kept their Judaism, says Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, with a kvetch. What does that mean? Oi. Oh, it's Shabbos again. Oh, no, it's Yom Kippur. Oh, no, I've got to give Sadaka. Now, we all do that sometimes, but we can't always be like that because our kids hear us and we hear us. And they're, we're going to associate Judaism, as I've said before, with the oi and not the joy. And therefore, we've got to show excitement that it's new and it's fresh and there's opportunity. It's very much like I speak about in my Wednesday classes, those who join us. I say, if you want to give your kids good self-esteem, there's one tried and tested method. And that is to have good self-esteem yourself. Because self-esteem is contagious. Good self-esteem just transmits to other people. It rubs off like a good smell. So too, if we're passionate about Judaism, about Torah, about mitzvah, about the opportunity to do the right thing that Torah wants us to do, boom, that gets passed on to our children. That is how we keep Torah fresh. That, I believe, is exactly what the Torah is talking about when it talks about a mincha chadasha. Let the Torah be new. And therefore, the Torah could not be ascribed a date or a name. It cannot be ascribed a location. We know the Torah was given in a desert. And we mentioned before that deserts are ownerless places. No one owns it. No one says, ah, that little area over there, that half a mile, that's mine. Right? It's just miles and miles of nothingness. Because the Torah should be open to everyone. It's not only available to a small, elite group of individuals. That's not the reason the Torah was given. It's not some old ancient text that should be pulled off a shelf and studied by some weird academic in some closed off ivory tower of great knowledge. It's not string theory. It's for everyone. It's for a child who is two years old, 10 years old, 20, 50, 80, 99, 120. The same Torah is available and owned by the greatest Torah scholar and the same person that I will get to see and I will learn and say, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalad. Right? It's the same Torah, my friends. That, my friends, is how we keep the Torah fresh. By being excited about it and seeing it as a daily gift that's been given to us, the Jewish people. Nothing, nothing at all is as great and important as that. One last idea. How... Are we meant to celebrate Shavuot? So there's no object. So what are we doing? And this is a famous discussion in the Gemara. And one opinion comes from a verse that says, you know what? Shavuot is all about doing everything for Hashem. And there's another opinion that says, no, it's actually Shavuot, it's Chag Lachem for you. So we have two contradictory ideas. Either it's for Hashem or it's for us. Which one is it? And the compromise that is found for the Jewish holidays is that it's chetzi Hashem and chetzi lachem. Half for God and half for you. Well, what does that mean? How is Shavuot or any Jewish holiday half for God and half for us? And actually this discussion is centered explicitly and specifically around Shavuot. And the answer is mechsa mechsa. You're going to spend half the day. It doesn't literally mean half the day. It means a part of the day is going to be involved in God's stuff, praying and learning Torah. And half the day is spent enjoying yourself, eating good food, drinking drinks that you like to drink. And if that means a little bit of alcohol, so be it. And wearing nice clothes and buying expensive objects to 
decorate and make your home look beautiful for the holiday itself. All of these things are a mitzvah and they're all part of the chetzi lachem, half for you, so that we get to enjoy it. Actually, the commentators say that the way you demonstrate that Shavuot is a special holiday, this applies to all holidays, we're going to just focus and double click on Shavuot, is by eating good food, enjoying yourself, not do any malacha, any forbidden activities, unless they're related and connected to food preparation, ochel nefesh, which you are allowed to do on the Jewish holidays, unlike Shabbat and Yom Kippur, which are called Shabbat Shabbaton. So those two are separate. You cannot do any of the forbidden malachot, 39 labors of Shabbat and Yom Kippur, but you can do food preparation. So everything that you do to make this day holy and special, the food, the clothes, the jewelry, whatever it is you need to do, you should do. And that becomes half of our connection to making Shavuot holy and special. How do we celebrate the giving of the Torah? We have a good time. That is what we do to signify that we've come to such a special, important time. And so our children see that and they see how we enjoy this day. Who doesn't want to have a beautiful, fun, exciting day passed on to their children? And who doesn't want to keep doing it in their own lives? And when you get to celebrate and you don't regret the fact you can't use your phone and you don't regret the fact you can't check your Bitcoin or whatever you're dealing with right now at work and you don't regret the fact you can't be here or there and you just got to be present in the moment, celebrating and enjoying the holiday itself. That, to the commentators, is the ultimate connection that ties us directly to Matan Torah. That is how to receive the Torah today. And that's how to keep it fresh. By making everything you do as a Jew exciting, new, whether your prayers are new, whether it means I even do this myself. Sometimes I just buy a new Siddur. The old Siddur looks good, it's been very worn, but sometimes I want a new commentary. So I'll buy a new Siddur. I've pretty much given up trying to buy books because I have so many I haven't read yet. Right? But whatever you need to do in order to make that connection, Mincha Chadasha, a new sacrifice. Keep your Judaism fresh. Find ingenious ways to engage yourself. It could be a different class. It could be an object you buy. It could be a hobby that you have connected to it. It could be helping other people do mitzvah. That, that is the key to finding a mincha. Hadasha. Wishing you all a beautiful and amazing Shavuot. May we all receive the Torah with great health and with great safety. Of course, our brothers and sisters in the land of Israel are going through tremendous challenges. We always should be sending them our support, our love, our prayers, and learning Torah in their merit. Wishing you all a wonderful, fantastic Shavuot. Thank you, guys.